All right, Guru Nation, we're live. Let me turn off the music. Better late than never. Seven minutes late. We got more people joining. You know, it's a work day, guys and gals. So, you know, people are busy. I just came back from the clinic. I'm sure Monica did too. Robert, Darshan, thank you guys so much. We're going to get into introductions. First, before anything, got to thank the sponsor of the podcast because this is going on the podcast. Viva. It's Isn't it obvious who it is? It's Viva, right? They're here to change the game, guys. They're empowering sites. They're empowering sponsors again. They get a free electronic regulatory system for sites. Free. No contract needed. It's a great way to dabble if your site's not already digitized into getting digitized. If you're already using other systems, like we use eSource, which comes with an e-reg. I use Viva. I'm starting to transition the e-reg to Viva, so I started putting my SOPs on there. Little by little, I'm going to start using their delegation of authorities log. So everybody check it out. Site Vault. Link is underneath for Viva. Thank you, Viva. Um, and it's the future. I mean, obviously, things are getting digitized, and Viva's here for the long run. They're not trying to monetize the sites. They're already making plenty of money from the sponsors. Over 450 sponsors use them. So the benefit is it's passive sharing of regulatory docs once your sponsor is is giving you a study and you're on site vault. They don't need to email you and say, hey, where's the financial disclosure form for a sub by XYZ? It's already there. So they're not going to ask you any more things. And as we know, time is money for coordinators. Um, Dr. Fox Get on, man. You're supposed to be here. You're supposed <laughs> to be here. So thank you guys all for coming. Tech is the future, and we are living in the future. So thank you for bearing with me for that intro. Put all your comments, guys, in the comment box below. We're here. We got Robert Goldman. He's a study director for a sponsor. He's been doing this for over a decade we have Darshan Kulkarni, world famous Darshan Kulkarni. <laughs> All roads lead to Darshan because he's, <laughs> he's a pharmacist and an attorney, but this is not legal or medical advice. Thank you. God and he has a both. great sense of humor. <laughs> yes. You're very kind, Monica. Also, you're both great liars. I'll take it. <laughs> and we've got Monica Quitiva, my business partner for years. One of the most <laughs> optimistic people I've ever met. If Monica doesn't think your idea will work, it's there's no hope. <laughs> <laughs> there's no hope. We give everything the Monica test first. Um, and she's a site owner, CRC Academy. Hello, hello. Uh, Raul Gonzalez. All right. Hi, um, everyone. Robert. Darshan, hey, Raul. how are you? Side owner, hey, Raul. like a research CRC Academy. Raul's a like a newer site owner. Let me put so my glasses like, on. Like, yeah, get your glasses. <laughs> you know, you got to respect the um, infrared, right? Or, or is that you blue light? Like the beard, blue dude. Light. It's you the blue. Like Look at that beard. No shave November, man. It's the last day. <laughs> I'm actually debating like tomorrow, should I shave or not? I don't know. Kind of got used to it. Raul, Raul keeps his going too. Um, link. Oh, Dr. Fox, if you want the link, it's in your email. I just sent reply all to the guests. I, I, I will say that to him again. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and we'll have more guests as they come on. I think there's like three more people that are gonna be jumping on. We're gonna be here for a while. If any guest needs to leave, just leave, you know, it's okay. But we'll be here as long as it takes. We've got Guru Nation gonna be asking questions. Like, subscribe, comment, share if you're on YouTube, Facebook. LinkedIn, and let's get this going. So, where do we start? Let's. Why don't we start with um, tech? All right, technology is predicted to by 2025, and this was before COVID. There was this stat I read that stuck with me. This was pre-COVID in one of these publications everyone respects. Tech vendors are going to be taking the majority of clinical trial budgets by 2025. I think we're already there. I don't think I think COVID expedited that. I, I, I personally see it different. I think tech vendors are going to take the clinical trials budget only because they're so expensive. Um, I, I think that there is tremendous value they can add to the process, but I don't think that it's it's 
at the expense of what everyone else is doing. I don't think a tech vendor replaces who's actually going to go and actually talk to patients and get informed consent. I think your sites, whatever version oh. of sites we talk about, they will continue to exist. CROs, will, everything will be augmented by tech, but it does, tech doesn't replace, it augments as I see it. I agree, 100% agree. I think a lot of things get mixed together or to use an attorney word, favorite <laughs> word, commingled together. Um, what attorney are you talking to that's using commingle so often? I got a couple. They've taught they've <laughs> told me that word several times. Like be careful, Dan. It's called commingling. Okay. I learned okay. early there, Sean. Um but we're confusing DCT. So DCT, by the way, have you guys seen this post? People are now saying, okay, decentralized clinical trial, should we get rid of that word? Now that it became a buzzword, <laughs> people want to get rid of it. Uh, One, actually, it's not working, right? Like, why are, like, okay, let's build up this word in everyone's vocabulary to confuse everyone. And now let's change it because either because it's not working or it's like we need a new buzzword. Well, I, I disagree. <laughs> I, I did this with Brad, actually. I did an interview for H1 with Brad and Brad Hightower for those people. He, he'll probably jump on anyways. And we had this exact discussion. And my opinion is that the reason I'm not a fan of DCT as a buzzword, and, and I say this because I have a tremendous amount of respect for, for Craig Lipset and who actually runs the Alliance. So I'm, I'm very oh, respectful. That, love that. Dude. Yeah. The, the, the only issue I have with it is it doesn't mean anything right now. It means whatever that specific tech vendor at any given time wants it to mean. If you are uh, really into making patient lives easier and you're really into patient centricity, well, you're going to throw DCT on there because, you know what, making things work at home is suddenly DCT and not patient centricity. Tomorrow, you really like the idea that uh, you you want to bring the patients into the pharmacy. Now, suddenly it's about the pharmacy. That's also DCT. I have no issue with it really being DCT if someone tells me what, what that actually means. The fact is that right now it just means anything you want it to mean. And to me, that's that's not valuable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Anyone else? <laughs> have... I just I, I think I that whenever you valuable. whenever you add the words convenient to anything, you're going to like quadruple the cost. And I think that may be what you're finding here is DCT equals more money. I know that I... the studies out there say differently. I know people are trying to demonstrate it and show everything, but uh, just from what I've seen, I mean. DC, I was on a lot of the DCT SAGs um, in the beginning, and that was the first thing that they said. You know, even my wife said, There's a reason why you stopped doing house calls. I mean, there's a reason. Uh, and I think it worked well during COVID, but just as what Darshan was saying, maybe if you want to maintain the concept of what we call DCT, we should really define it in a way that we can all understand and agree to. I, I think Craig actually made a point about this. The, the uh, pitch you were talking about was earlier from Craig himself, where he was talking about how we should get rid of that term because eventually DCTs is just going to, if it, if it actually takes, it'll just mean clinical trials. It's just another way of doing clinical trial, which is great. Um, yeah. So to me, the the, the point that uh, Dan's raising here, and I apologize, I refuse to call anyone doctor, including myself, because it's just too much. <laughs> Fine by me. <laughs> Good. Me too. Uh, but uh, two, uh, it reminds me of that uh, same from k pack or something where everyone's a, everyone is a doctor. So, uh, <laughs> well, you forgot Dr. Anyways, Robert Goldman, too. I forgot. There you, go. Is a doctor <laughs> there well. you go. There uh, you go. So, so my, my question is, though, if you're going to do DCT, um, is there a way to actually add value? Like, I feel like there is, like, I, th I think there's a role for pharmacists, pharmacies to play and pharmacists to play. I just, and, and, I feel like we need to define what that word means in that format. But right now it's just become a bucket term for anything you want to throw in. So if you want to say pharmacies are going to play a really big role in patient enrollment, great. Let's, let's describe that role and call that what that is, as opposed to anything you want it to mean. So that'd be my take. I also let's, break it, let's break it down even simpler for the audience. Anything that doesn't happen inside the brick and mortar office is DCT. No, uh, arguably, is arguably. 
Well, I, I don't I don't believe that, Darshan, right? But okay. I'm just saying the the the, the perception is okay. you know, now, anything that eases the patient burden and happens outside of the office, whether it's telehealth, whether it's AI yeah. using for IP yeah. administration, it's it's all of a sudden DCT hybrid. And yeah. you're right, it's just it's just a blanketed term. So Nobody back, really quite understands what it is. I agree. So back in two thousand six when I called my patients uh to come in and back then the sponsor we used ivrs to call yeah. their meds in so when i called a patient on the phone and said hey um sponsor said you can do this visit by phone if you want i'm just gonna check if you have any aes so that was dct back then and no vendors were getting rich off of that maybe the phone company <laughs> I, I think so just to confirm convenience really that's really what it's become convenience is dct and oh no again there's the yeah that, the that convenience word so do you think that dcts have to happen at the patient's home because no. it's not the brick and mortar yeah. of the site no, you can take them to the pharmacy you okay, could do the that pharmacy. Like the from the pharmacy and then say that's a dct theoretically or even a even an offsite satellite lab, right? Go send them to LabCorp, send them to Quest. You know, I mean, it, it, that's the whole misconception of the process, right? I mean, anything that happens—that's what I'm saying. Anything in the most simplistic form that happens outside of the brick and mortar site could be perceived as DCT. That's why there's well, so much yeah. ambiguity. I'm going to ask you a question because that's—I appreciate you raising it, but I've never heard heard it used that way. Have you you have you seen the term? lab-based clinical trial because I've never seen it done that way and I've never seen I've always thought of a lab always being outside the site uh, I mean I've, I've worked with several sites that'll do that and that's always been part of the the formula you already use so to me someone saying oh the lab is off-site therefore this is a DCT study would be a step too far because it's already done uh, yeah yeah, I mean, what, what I mean, Darshan is in the in the event where an unscheduled lab draw is potentially needed um, you know, or the workflow itself is is designed where a patient needs to go to their local lab prior to randomization visit to ensure that their labs qualify for inclusion and exclusion eligibility. You know, I, I'm just trying to make it in a very simplistic manner where in the event, you know, PI calls the site or the subject consents to getting labs off site versus them being drawn on site and being shipped out to a central lab or in the case of a phase two study you know they're they're having it mostly local labs on on site or or some site that's contracted with their local lab um just can be perceived as as this you know like it, it all circles back to really what does dct mean so i'm just just adding fuel to the conversation in terms of you know just the ambiguity around around yeah. the term itself it's yeah. it's uh, all in the eye of the beholder i think I think what I should clarify is it doesn't matter what side you're on. I will take the opposite side. So oh, I love it. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I, I have a, um, uh, I mean, a point here is in order to describe or to or to put a yeah description to DCT, maybe the main thing is to find what's the really real purpose, because it's to benefit who at the end of the day, right? If, if the patients are the ones that are going to get benefit from it by participating from the comfort of their houses or is because it's going to get uh, it's going to reach more patients um, in areas that maybe in the past were not able to to reach because there is no clinics everywhere. So I think to 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 find the definition, we need to define first the actual purpose and uh, the benefit that is this going to bring either to the industry or to the end consumers? Monica, I would say that that's mm -hmm. relatively well defined only because it means everything they want it to mean. So this second, I could very easily to the point you're making, say the benefit of DCT is patient compliance. It is te technology enablement. It is cost reduction, all of which are true because I'm not telling you what it actually does. It, uh, so to your point, we can define a purpose. But is that the only purpose is the question? And I think that's the problem. Uh, well, to, to your point, the there's bills. no event for Actually, It's yeah. the sponsors paying the bills, right? So obviously, whatever they bring on has to, of course, benefit the patients, but has to benefit the sponsors because they're the ones trying to get the medications or the IP approved 
that's gonna in theory help the patients and dan i can talk on that i mean the benefit that we look at when we when we look at these hybrid dct models whatever you want to say is strictly speed of enrollment what value does it bring you know right darshan i mean it, it, it that that's exactly what it is it's you know we can we can randomize x amount of patients in x amount in y amount of time and that's the cost savings because we know every day you extend the timelines out for a clinical trial it can translate to millions of dollars right so that's how they spin it in terms of an roi from a sponsor perspective but at the end of the day, you know, we implement this to ease the burden in terms of patient centricity. That's the, at least that's what I like to believe why we came up with DCT, but I don't know the, the motive yeah. really. I have it. another question in regards to that too. Uh, if with the DCT maybe, I mean, if, if it's true, um, like, you know, like, like, uh, like cookie cutting, you know, it can be, it can be sacrificing the quality over the quantity. I mean, the, yeah, over the quantity, because we don't know if they, if they, like, for example, let's say mental health, if we're doing a research for mental health and everything is done remotely, I, I'm not sure to what extent that's going to be effective or even for other conditions, like for example, for pain, ma pain management or for uh, conditions that require that face-to-face -face with the doctor or with the, or the contact with the study coordinator that could get a better da data for the study? I, I would argue you can get better oversight, quite honestly, with a decentralized study if you assume decentralized means uh, technology enabled. And what I mean by that is with telehealth, for example, I can check in on subjects on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, if I really wanted to. Um, you can't do that with the site. It's just impossible to do. Uh, the patient has a life to live. I would also, to, to the point Rob made a little bit ago, I think the other argument is that, um, you, yes, you are 100% starting with enrollment, but I think that's, again, influenced by the discussions you've had with the FDA, what they're looking to see and right now, um, the FDA and, and a lot of other agencies are kind of love the idea, they love the concept of DCT studies because number one, they're easier to monitor. B, they're actually also this funding for it. So everyone's saying, well, how can we use all this technology to, um, to to make our lives easier? So I think that all that plays a role at a strategy level um, because the last thing you want is to piss off the FDA. Uh, when they've said that this is a direction we'd like you to consider. So that's the other part. So two responses from a, from an FDA regulatory slash legal perspective. So I have a question. Is anybody actually doing a decentralized study? Right well, now? You know what <laughs> if you can tell me what well, that means. Well, if you consider phone visits, phone call to <laughs> patient, then yes. What's that, Dan? We are high tech. <laughs> Well, okay. So if, if we follow Darshan's definition, where it's technology based, technology driven, and we actually get it away from the patient's home, that's, you know, when, when DCTs were hitting during COVID, that was the big thing is we're going to come to your home. We're going to help you do a trial. We're going to do everything at home. That was a disaster because you have patients with bed bugs, you have hoarders, you have crazy cat people, you have very like inappropriate conditions for research purposes. And then it turned into, well, are you going to pay your patient's electric bill? Cause it's going to get shut off and you're going to have a temp temperature excursion. So it's like, we say that we're going to be put, you know, reducing patient burden, but then by bringing the trial into their homes, we actually just compromise the quality of the experiment because of the conditions, but then also if we're expecting them to pay for some of the infrastructure that sites generally pay for just to maintain the trial. So now to your question, it, it, are we doing any trials where we're basing the trial off of the patient's home? No, we're not doing that kind of DCT, but we are doing many different trials that are technology driven to try to expand our footprint across the so community. how is that really any different than what we've been doing though? Exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, so, I'm not using the only new technology I'm using is electronic records and right. paper and or electronic. That, that's yeah. back to my original like question. Either. Why even have this word? I feel like it's just for a bunch of startup companies to please yeah. their 
VC. Well, yeah, I saw one raise money. <laughs> Somebody's address today from one of the sponsors or CROs said their name, and below it, it said decentralized and their address. What does that mean? Yeah, who knows? Who they knows just wanted means? to show that that they're supporting it or that they're... And then they realize, okay, well, we can go to Walgreens and CVS now, and maybe this is no longer decentralized. Maybe this is like a new SMO, but better because we can trust them because while patients wait in line for their refills, they also can be sold a bag of chips and soda (laughs) while they wait because it's the same Walgreens that let uh, Theranos into their company. Oh, that's pushing it. That, that's pushing that's pushing it. it. I never partner with anyone like Theranos at my site. That's the bad word. Wearing the Viva shirt. <laughs> Viva, yeah, Viva. <laughs> These, they're farthest thing from Theranos. They that's, started out. That's the exactly scale. what Fortune Magazine said for Theranos and for whatever the F- FTX. Man, wait till they write one on on Walgreens and CVS. But seriously. Like, why don't we, if it works so well, because we have, we have one, two, three, four, and myself, five side owners on here, like no nonsense studies. I mean, everything's done in our office. Occasionally we have a phone call with the patient, All right? Why, if, if these, if these strategies work so well, why are we seeing more studies than ever? We're actually turning down studies because we're getting too many. And, and why aren't Walgreens and CVS getting more studies? Like, Robert, why you didn't use Walgreens for one of your studies to give them the So, study? yeah, I mean, number one, I think they, they serve a purpose, like for vaccine trials, um, you know, different types of studies. They, they, they probably serve a purpose. But from a sponsor perspective, I can tell you DCT companies, not to call out any specific ones, they are extremely cost prohibitive. And I don't care if you're coming from large, the largest of the largest pharma that has an unlimited printing press, or you're coming from a startup biotech, um, you know, like a company I'm currently affiliated with. They are absolutely cost prohibitive. It is almost four to five times more expensive in terms of cost per patient to execute a whatever they call DCT, you know, incorporating the e-consent, home visits, a virtual site, whatever you want to call it. Um, it. It is absolutely cost prohibitive. And I've had a lot of discussions with internal colleagues, outside colleagues, VPs at other companies, and they share the same sentiment. Um, so unless you are a Pfizer, Merck, Takeda, Johnson & Johnson, um, the likelihood and adoption rate of such a, a, a strategy and model is just going to be low for financial purposes. It's that simple. I, I would add to that. I think, um, and I say this as a pharmacist, so, um, and this is to my pharmacy colleagues, and I have a lot of respect for them. I don't know why I have all these disclaimers coming in, but anyway, that's <laughs> a, a creator somehow as I say this. Um, because you're a lawyer. On th- that too, unfortunately. <laughs> that's no, but, not but, legal but, advice. Uh, exactly, uh, or, or pharmacy advice. But no, the, my concern is this. As a pharmacist, I filled a whole bunch of prescriptions. I was filling 300 prescriptions a day. Number one, I was overworked. Um, you add more stuff to the pile of things people have to do. Pharmacists just literally started quitting. I don't know if you guys follow this, but yeah, pharmacists yeah. just said, I don't care what you're paying me. Pharmacists getting paid six figures a year, and they said, I'd rather not have I had one it. email me the other day. Hey, I'm getting tired yeah. of my job yeah. in retail. I want to start a site. Right. So that's happening as we speak. Uh, and that's because they just added vaccinations to the process. Um, I, it's funny to me, I was never trained to be a, a person who actually vaccinated people. I know that there are, there's training now, and I literally got vaccinated by a pharmacist day before yesterday. Um, uh, but the point being, it's not something we got trained in. We're now being asked to do clinical research, which is great, except we've never been trained on what that actually means. And I've seen some of the training out there. It's terrible. And I mean that for across the board, not just for pharmacists, but pharmacists never got trained to go down that path. Um, I remember someone asking me to do heart rates and uh, get a pulse, and I don't know how to do it right. I, the only reason I know it somehow is because, quite bluntly, I did judo, and I needed to know that for my resting heart rate. But outside that, that was one big concern. The second thing is I don't get ICD-9 codes. So how am I supposed to narrow down my patient population? So I don't care whether you're a CVS or a Walgreens or you're like a mom and pop store. I know that you're coming in for a medication. I have no idea what that medication is being used for. So to me, that's a huge issue. 
because you can't narrow the population down, which means that large pharmacies are excellent at being able to throw people at the problem, but cannot in any way narrow down, as, as far as I know, narrow down what the indication is unless you're vertically integrated and you can actually buy into the databases that tells you what the person was actually getting. So the big question you start, uh, you need to start figuring out is while you, they might work for a vaccine trial where everyone needs to get the vaccine, how does it work for say an oncology study with very specific inclusion exclusion criteria? How does it work for someone who has a, um, I don't know, uh, some, some version of diabetes? So you can tell that they, they're diabetic from certain meds they get, but let's say it's, it's CHF. Let's say it's a type of CHF. How are you gonna narrow that down? How do you know it's not just being used for hypertension? That, those types of questions you simply can't answer. And I don't, I don't know how you get past that. I don't know how that business model works, though. Yeah, so Darshan, I, I think, you know, and, and maybe it's my just misconception. I, I was under the impression, we, you know, CVS, Walgreens, are, they're not targeting the PharmDs to actually be the investigators. They're, they're looking at the minute clinics and the mid-level nurse practitioners that are running these minute clinics as sub-investigators which 90% of the time anyways, from my perspective, are doing the patient assessments anyway as they're being delegated, right? So I think it could work for, you know, diabetes, CHF, great, you know, cardiovascular, um, gas GI issues. In terms of an oncology study, that's a very difficult, um, you know, a, a, that's, a, that's a big bear to, to achieve with a mid-level. Not to say that it's not possible, but, um, you know, it, it's, are you going to start sending in staff that don't work for CVS Walgreens to, to start seeing these patients because they have access to them? Is it a referral model? I mean, I think the benefit of the CVS Walgreens ideal is that they're everywhere, right? It's access to people who would never otherwise have access to a potential option, because of the, they're just, you know, every corner or every, you know, every target has a CVS inside of it and they have these minute clinics and they're 24 hours and they're just super, super readily available. So I think using the mid levels would be a benefit for patient access. But in terms of how you operationalize that, you're right. There's a lot to learn about. So, so here's my real question. I agree with you, Bob, uh, Rob. I, I totally see your point that maybe it's not the pharmacist doing it. Maybe it's the mid level, which is a great idea. But I don't know, I haven't looked at the numbers. Are minute clinics, if you will, um, like such a huge portion of their of, of how Walgreens and CVS works? They, they might have a certain amount of volume, they may be growing, but have they taken over the market to such an extent where they can start saying that this is where we're gonna pull your patients from? I'm, I'm asking. No, I mean, it's a, great, it's a great question. I can tell you from personal experience, just walking into a CVS, I mean, there's, you know, at any given time, six to 10 people waiting for, uh, a, you know, a nurse practitioner to see them for whatever ailment they may have, you know, so I don't know what the market share is, but I would assume it's, it's, it, it must be something or they wouldn't have it. Right. See, it's my exact opposite because where I am, they're literally mm. zero at any, I can wow. walk in at any time at zero. The only exception has been for vaccinations and it's usually like a pharmacist waiting in there. Hence the question. So it's and if yeah. we are and if we are to the equation the shortage in the industry i mean as as it is we are, we don't have enough uh staff or enough workforce to cover what we have imagine now walgreens uh, or any of these uh, big pharmacies looking for more staff to add to the equation so <laughs> that's going to make it even more difficult i'm going to combine I'm, I'm going to combine what, is that my voice? Uh, no, I said they have cashiers. Oh, oh, oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you we want, can train them. Fries with that? Do you want uh, fries with that uh, A1C <laughs> test? I'm going to combine what Rob and Monica said, though. It's an interesting concept I hadn't thought of till the second. The, so they say that on average, you have 3% of physicians doing studies at any given time, but it's something like 90% turn, turnover every year. Or, or over X number of period. Um, what, what Rob's pointing out and what Monica's pointing out is interesting, which is you bring in the mid-level practitioners, maybe you get a little bit more consistency, may, maybe yeah. you get a little bit more um, sort of less turnover because mid-levels don't turn over possibly as but much. But sponsors as have been hesitant. We've been trying to push our NPs to be PIs for the longest time. 
it's it's like you have to move mountains they have to be they have to have worked on a previous study with the sponsor as a sub buy they have to know the right people at the company and even then they're hesitant you know because but, the fda everybody's afraid of the fda so if, if are, all the other sites are, are mds yeah i'm not Walgreens. it might be even harder for walgreens how do you prove oversight um well, of so many staff and so many patients it's actually no harder to practitioner. You know, I have a question for Darshan before we all jump in. So Darshan, from a legal regulatory perspective, my opinion on it is, you know, PAs are a different story, but nurse practitioners, they're working on their own medical license. Depends. They have, it depends. depends, on the state. depends okay, on the state. so, okay, fair enough. So, I mean, in, in Arizona, for example, sure. they work under their own medical license. They, sure. they, they, they have their own MPI number. They don't have to answer to any physician they work with. They're liable. They have their own malpractice insurance. You know, what's to say that that particular person from a regulatory perspective doesn't fulfill the 1572 obligations of a principal investigator? I, I didn't say that they, I'd have to go. No, I, I, didn't, I didn't say no, you no, didn't I, say, I'm just asking no, your opinion. No, no. Okay. Fair enough. Let me rephrase what I was saying. Yeah. Uh, what I was saying was I, I would, again, without checking, I don't think there's a requirement that they have to have an MD. Uh, yeah. I'm pretty sure yeah. the requirements generally are you need to be appropriately qualified. And the, the FDA does not generally say what appropriate qualification that's right. means. That's right. That's so right. if that's true, there's really nothing out there that should say that they are not appropriately qualified. Having said that, there, there possibly are limits to what appropriately qualified means. So um, you, you take an NP and you put her in charge of a surgical study, and then you're pushing the definition of appropriately qualified. You take that same NP, put them in charge of a pneumonia study, you're probably fine. So um, how does all that play out? It may be case by case specific, and I'd love to ha have an NP tell me um, if tell me differently. We've got Clara, by the way, who has a question. As yeah, this Clara has a good question. Um, and by the way, I should add, like NPs, at least in Arizona, the they're only allowed to bill eighty five percent of what a MD can bill if they operate on their own um, for Medicare reimbursement. But, so they're not even treated the same from from payers. So but Dan, that's, that doesn't change anything. It doesn't change anything. And from also, like a legal that, aspect. No, but Dan, but that's why so many of them are employed at these offices exactly, now, right? Exactly. I mean, it, it's like why would I hire another MD or a DO when I can hire a mid level, pay them half, which I'm not saying is the right thing to do, but it's it's reality, and and get the same outcome. But Robert, who's training these nurse practitioners at CVS to do research? Well, that's, that's a whole other slides. ball of wax, a right? A CRA really yeah. slides to and, them. And, and, then, and, then then they they CBS, <laughs> and then if CVS train them and pay them less, what is going to to to, uh, to stop them to move to the sponsor, to the CROs, where they get paid much, much better? That'll happen once so, they find out, Monica. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, is, that, is that what is exactly the same situation with the CRCs? We train them, we teach them, six months, one year, they go Adios. in a different direction. Exactly. Yep. So, Welcome, Ikevia. <laughs> Welcome, so if, if that, Exactly. So if that <laughs> happens with the sites already, what do you expect is going to happen with the CVS? They're going to exactly. have to pay them really, really well to have retention. Turnovers. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Exactly. And turnover is much point. more expensive. And turnover is much more expensive than the money that they will be making with this, the, the, uh, with the clinical trials. So I think CBS, Walgreens, if you're listening to this, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it. Clara, no. Clara, no. Says, what if Aetna was the sponsor? Aetna knows CBS. They talked oh. about doing their home dialysis machine. So I would answer that question pretty simply. You can't, from a legal perspective, and again, just to qualify, and whenever I say from a legal perspective, I am not giving legal advice, just to be very, very clear. I also know You're nothing about- You're opening an avenue for Aetna to reach out to you directly. There you go. Um, but generally speaking, <laughs> uh, the, uh, Aetna would not have access to the CVS database, and CVS would not have access to the Aetna database. They would have to treat each other like separate companies. You can't just go, oh, I own you or you own me. I'm just going to share databases. 
if that happened, there'd be all kinds of other issues you'd need to deal with. The FTC would not be happy. Um, and, and that's not counting the IRB itself that would have questions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I have to think that CVS has a uh, false sense of security or Walgreens with their patient database that they feel like they're going to get these people in to do research any better than the rest of us. I mean, that's that can yeah, be a struggle even on thing. the best day. This is what I was going to add on to Monica's excellent point about staff retention. Like, that's a real problem. One of the benefits of being small is I can, me as the owner, I could get to know all my employees. I take them all out to lunch one on one every three months, do a one on one review. I tell them, hey, I don't care if you want to start a clinic. Like, you just be honest with me. Give me X amount of time. I'll help you do it. There's no way they're getting that kind of transparency at CVS Walgreens. They look I'll, at it more as like in and out and that's it. So like, how are they going to deal with the staff turnover? I, I'll, I'll give you a different version of that fact, though. The fact is that pharmacists were at one point the most trusted profession in the world. Nurses were mm -hmm. at one point and they may still be the most trusted profession in the world. You take both of them, put them together. That's, that's <laughs> more trustworthy. But there, Sean, that was mom and pop days of pharmacy. That was not I don't, I'm not saying that's necessarily true. I'm not disagreeing That's with and you. Pop, when they knew <laughs> they knew your grandkid's uh, birthday and they gave you like a free cake for him that day. That's like not happening at CVS or Walgreens. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Let's, say, let's say they are the, the more trustworthy and everything is wonderful. But then as soon as, as they see the difference of the salary working in Walgreens, doing research and then working with the sponsor, that goes mm -hmm. through the window <laughs> and they will move to the other company right away and they bring their professionalism mm -hmm. their trustworthiness somewhere else where it's more valuable and and more uh and, and they feel more um i mean that they they, they are getting more value for their knowledge i, I don't think Appreciate you it. no I, I disagree with you monica and i'll tell you why i disagree having worked as a pharmacist i can tell you what one of the things you're looking for is change. Like, filling pills is repetitive, it's routine, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's a pain. You tell someone that today you can be filling pills, tomorrow I'm going to have you in clinical research. If you're good, day after tomorrow you can be in the minute clinic guiding someone, and day, the day after that you, you can be on the, I'm making this up, um, you can be looking at Fitbits and talking about healthcare. You, I would tell you that that's a job I would sign up for, because that sounds fun. That sounds like there's a change in my lifestyle. Right now, all I, if, if I'm, all I'm doing is licking, sticking, counting, pouring, that's, that's more of an issue for me than the money. At, at a certain point, when you're making six figures, you, your salary is not going to change that much. Uh, you need change. You want job satisfaction. And I think that's what people are looking for. Yeah, but, but, the, but the sponsor offers that too. And you're it's more say, exciting. That's how do you figure out the sponsor offers that? I mean, the, the sponsor offers exciting projects that you can maybe move in and exciting opportunities and not doing that job every day. Just, you know, <laughs> it, no, I, I mean, that's actually that's actually why I joined the, one of the points I joined the industry, because every you're not you're not doing the same thing over and over again. You just get different projects. And that's the exciting part of research. That's so amazing. And then on top of that, you see that reflected in the quality of life of other people, especially when you see that the drug or the treatment that you work on is is uh, is is helping somebody that you maybe know. So so, uh, so it, the, the difference is uh, the pathway. And what I mean by that is you I went to pharmacy school for well, I did in five, most people do in six. So six years of pharmacy school, some people do eight years of pharmacy school. What you hear about all the time is you're either going to go into retail, and, and that's considered to be a really bad thing. And there's a whole discussion about that, but people look at pharmacy as I really don't want, want to go down the retail path because I will never use my clinical knowledge, I, my six year degree, my eight year degree. No, no one, yeah. So you want to go down the hospital path. That becomes the big thing you want to aim for. You do two additional years of, of residency. You do you get a BCPS after that, all that good stuff. What you're telling me instead is I'm going to use that knowledge and put it into into use in a retail setting. You will you, once you come in, you will have opportunities you didn't see before and you'll get to use it from day one. Yes, maybe the sponsor offers that, but I don't know what the sponsor is even thinking about. 
from a pharmacist perspective, I literally don't think of them as sponsors. I think of them as industry, hospital, and retail. And industry, you and I know that there are literally a thousand jobs in industry. To them, it's just one industry. And people then go, what kind of jobs can I do? So it's the lack of knowledge. And it's the unknown, it's the fear of the unknown that you're dealing with. So yes, I could go work for a Pfizer. I could go work for a Merck or to a startup. That'd be great, but I don't know what I'm walking into. I know what I'm doing right now in retail because I went through six years of college and they can tell me what I'm looking at. And that has a lot of value. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, you know, I mean, you're, you're a pharmacist. Yeah. <laughs> it's all about personality. Look, we, we yeah. just hired a PharmD graduate from Rutgers. Um, he was part of an eight year program, did not want to go down the retail pathway. Um, and I've been working with him, training him from the ground up, you know, so I think it's all about the personality and, and really what you want to do. I mean, you know, some people are, are not adverse to the unknown and some people want regiment. It's, you know, uh, we all of us here on this channel can go work for, you know, Pfizer and have work instructions and SOPs or some of us can go to startups and write Build the it. SOPs and have and have no direction in a flat society. You know, yeah, so I mean, people, it's, yeah, that's it's right. all about, yeah, <laughs> it's all about what you want and, and things like that. I agree, some people agree can get you, motivated saying... with, a, with a bigger check than others, <laughs> too. No. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with you, Rob. The point I was making is volume wise. Sure. Where most people sure. want to follow a given path than Absolutely. take the path less taken. Sure, that's because all. you know that's that's what's ingrained in their heads in, in school. Look, when I was in med school, it was like, oh, you know, you're gonna go to residency, you're gonna do this, and I'm like, no, I'm actually gonna take an alternative pathway. You know, so am I the exception to the rule? Absolutely, but there are some of us, you know. So I mean, mm -hmm. that, that's that's exactly exactly true. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's all dependent on what that individual really wants to do. But I can see, Darshan, how you said, I mean, you know, going through eight years of school and going into a retail setting and doing that monotonous task all day, every day, yeah. you got to burn out. <laughs> well, this is a good segue to maybe this is episodes, obviously not sponsored by CVS or Walgreens. <laughs> 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 But clear, you know, I don't think any of them are bad. I just literally don't I understand met a the yet. few of them from um, at a DIA thing. They're actually cool people, like the director um, yeah. of one of the two. I can't remember which one, but cool people. They're the same. They're they're commoditized. Um, okay. Do you think like because this is a good segue? Like everything is getting bigger. We talked about mom and pop used to be the case. Now it's not. Maybe DCT is pharma's response to hey, where are all these independent physicians going? You know, like we all work with independent physicians on this site. I know all the site owners. They're all independent physicians. It's kind of a dying breed. Like these hospital systems, they're buying up all the practices. I remember when I was with Monica in Orange County, we were trying to find a new psychiatrist because our existing psychiatrist was too busy to provide enough oversight. So we were trying to find a brand new, fresh out of residency psychiatrist you know what we had to compete with? Kaiser Permanente. This is not sponsored by them either. Kaiser Permanente paying right out the gate 400 k a year salary. So how am I going to compete with that? Hey, brand new resident. Like, <laughs> you want to work for us in research? Like, we might pay you if we enroll patients. Or are you going to go with Kaiser where they will make you sign a contract so you cannot work with anyone else outside of us? And by the way, we do clinical research too. So... Do you think this is a good or bad thing, having more centralized, so not ironically, not decentralized, more centralized um, clinics, places where patients actually are seen? Because these independent clinics, they're kind of a dying breed, which is why the four side owners here, or five of us that are on here, one of the reasons we're doing so well, like pharma is hungry for these independent clinics. Do you think it's good or bad? And like, do you think these pharmacies are like, do you think they're trying to replace that? Do you think this is the industry's response to like getting ahead of this problem? I can tell you why we're hungry for your clinics. Yes. And we're, and we're not hungry Human for academics. You know, I, it, it's, it's, it's the startup timelines, right? 
there, there's, there's, you don't have to go through this ethics committee, yeah. this be bioethics committee, this com, you know, this approval, that approval, this local. You got to get a local IRB approval to use a central IRB. It's such a bureaucracy in hospitals and academic centers that it's just. It's unless we need you and your name associated with our submission, a certain KOL works there, you know, we, we go through it, but we never depend on these organizations for the, for the lump sum of our enrollment metrics, right? I mean, nothing, in my opinion, will ever replace, you know, the people I'm talking to on this call, the, the site owners, it, that, that's where the quality comes from and that's where the bulk of the patients come from. And that's just my two cents in the situation. I think, you know, there's just too many roadblocks and bottlenecks when you work with hospitals and academic institutions. Having, having negotiated with large academic institutions, I can say that um, behalf off and for, so both sides of that, um, I can tell you that large academic institutions, number one, are beholden to more issues, things that smaller sites simply aren't beholden to. Like they, their, their goal, for example, is to teach and educate. So if that's true, um, they, they have to make sure, for example, issues on IP have to be negotiated in a different way. Issues on um, publications have to be negotiated a different way. On the other hand, a site, a smaller site doesn't care. Like I, my, my doc isn't going and publishing this stuff anyway, so I can move past that contract negotiation a lot quicker. Uh, on the other hand, uh, cost. I think a smaller site tends to be, to the point uh, Rob's talking about, uh, a smaller site tends to be a little bit more nimble. They tend to be a little bit more cheap uh, compared to a large academic institution uh, because those larger larger academic institutions um, employ the KOLs, if you will, for lack of a better term. Um, and we really should use a better term because neither the FDA nor industry is a big fan of the term KOL right now. But uh, ignoring but they that, they love them. They love KOLs. They just don't like the term KOL. Well, because the DOJ will go after them for the term KOL. Tell <laughs> <laughs> uh, me what KOL is. Uh, key, key opinion, opinion leader. leader. Key opinion leader. Basically, uh, a doctor that other like uh, an influencer doctor that publishes, but also does research, but also prescribes a lot. Kind well, of under one. One roof. Well, down. no, no, I, I, I would disagree with that. I think the reason a KOL is a KOL is because they have a large amount of influence. So it might be because they were, uh, they treat a, a significant patient, a portion of the patient population, or doctors listen to the opinion of this person because he or she understands that that disease state better than most people uh, in that space. So it's not so much that they prescribe it more. Uh, it really shouldn't be based on that. It should be based on impact, but that has its own problems because are you are you bringing in this doctor because he can enroll or she can enroll in your study or because they have a, an unusual amount of impact? And the truth is that if you want your study to be noticed, if you if you want your study to have impact, you need one of those KOLs, at least one of those KOLs in there. On the other hand, to deal with them is often a giant pain in the ass, but it's a necessary evil that you have to balance against. Man, Darshan just nailed it. And they don't, and they typically, in my experience, do not, they, they do not contribute to the enrollment of the study. They are there because you need them. They have a tremendous level of impact. That's my perspective alone. You know, we, we don't, we don't, we don't approach that particular person, individual on the notion that they're going to be a contributor. They probably fall into that 25% of the sites who really aren't going to do much. And like Darshan said, giant. I, I should probably not. Yeah, I should probably be quiet <laughs> <laughs> in case the KOLs look, not, 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 not this. by KOLs. Either. Yeah, they they they're a tough crowd to work with. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> to say the can least, I've monitored KOLs. Before. Can we ask Deshaun a couple questions since he's an attorney? Yeah. Just to be clear, yeah, not legal advice. We, okay. well, yeah, not legal advice. <laughs> okay, so. All of us are site owners or clinic owners. So, what do you what do you see legally that, or, in your opinion, that we make mistakes at? Um, that's a great <laughs> question. That's a really <laughs> wide question to go after. I mean, it's it's, every, it's everything. Uh, site owner site owners number one. I think um, it's not so much mistakes as much as putting yourself in. Um, in a more compromising position than a larger academic institution might put themselves. And what I mean by that is um, 
I was involved in a, in a recent situation where, uh, in my opinion, the site owner was being bullied. And it, there's not much you can do because of the contract you signed. Uh, there's not much you can do because you didn't negotiate the contract because you were eager to get into the study because that pays for a lot of the bills that are coming through. But you've now compromised the position you're in. Uh, I think some of the other issues you will end up working through are um, you're, you're, you're often picking the battles you want to fight. But when you're picking those battles, what you land up with is creating a runway that demonstrates that you were okay with something for a large amount of time until you suddenly weren't. And now the sponsor's going, wait, this was okay like for the last 15, 16 months. You're coming and objecting to this now. Why? Um, and that that conversation, I, I think what you land up with, and, and uh, Brad's, Brad's very uh, vo uh, vocal about this, but um, it, it comes out because you're trying to work with the um, with, with the sponsor and the CRO and you're trying to build that relationship. However, it's, it's difficult sometimes to get access to the sponsor to build that same relationship. Having said that, whether or not there's a good reason for it, the fact is at the end, to the sponsor, it comes out of nowhere. Uh, or you, you're now dealing with, for example, um, uh, CROs who can punch above your weight class. And now you've got a situation where um, CROs are not paying you for six months, eight months, and you're accepting that because, well, you have no choice. You're seeing large academic, large academic institutions doing things like, you know what, I'm going to have a pool of money you need to pay into first before I'm going to start doing the work because I, I, I simply am not going to take a loss just because you guys shut down or anything like that. And CROs are willing to do that with either, as, as we discussed a few minutes ago, with a KOL or do that with a, uh, a large, if it's a Harvard, for example, they might consider doing that because they want that name associated with them. But they aren't going to do that for a smaller site. So it's not so much that you're making mistakes. It's the sheer lack of size that causes you to make compromises that come back to bite you. Yeah. Um, I think there is also a um, general overall lack of, how should I put this in a nice way? Because I've got five site owners on here. Um, <laughs> Watch out, man. We got pack scores. We got pack scores on you. No, so I mean, we're okay. 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 No, no, I, say I it. Say it. It's good I think the issue that I'm just battling with is, is um, you, you land up with a scenario where you've got people um, dealing with quality issues. Not because, again, they don't mean to. It's, it's one of those things that if you've got five people doing everything, there's only so much bandwidth they have. And if you have only so much bandwidth, the, the, you can't put in all the processes that you need because if you have that extra bandwidth, you're going to try to bring in more work, not develop your processes. And the result of it is at some point you get ahead of yourself. And developing those quality processes is critical, but it's not done as routinely in smaller sites as it might be in a larger organization. And, and the truth is that a larger organization doesn't do it as often as they probably should either. Let's be very clear about this. Um, I, I get brought in to help with those larger organizations. However, the fact is that they do it more often than a, than a smaller site would. Um, a site usually, it's, it's the equivalent of building a roof. A smaller site will generally not look at the roof. A larger site will generally patch the roof while the sponsor is expecting a brand new roof each time. So... I totally agree with you. That's why it's so important to have the staff trained, like, um, I mean, with one kind of training. Mm -hmm. So the sites can come to us. We train them properly. <laughs> well, we actually have a good question here from Clara and then somebody else who asked her to clarify. So, <clears throat> sorry, Rod, oh, no. just for a second. Yeah. Uh, I always thought the PI population to capitalize on is the physician who is semi-retired. This is kind of true. It does work. Clinics mm -hmm. ran into issues of insurance. I actually got a question from Fort Darshan via email that I'll read in a little bit. The PI got asked by the clinic to leave because of financial and insurance issues. Um, do you have any insight into why we don't have semi-retired PIs? So I think that's a clinic that missed the opportunity. Mm -hmm. But go ahead, Dr. Fox. I know we all have opinions on this one no the most of the pis in the area are over the age of 70 right now 
And a lot of that is because we simply can't pay the younger generation of investigators the amount of money that they need to survive. They have higher medical bills. They have, you know, continuous RVU requirements. It can't be costly for them to be investigators. Otherwise, they're just not going to do it. They're just going to say, I'll just start, you know, I'll just run more in my practice. I'll make more money that way. So it, you're seeing it, and literally the PI is an endangered species right now. And it's because we're not compensating them appropriately to market value. Uh Oh, I said it. <laughs> market, market value. value. I'm we glad you did. This yeah. I, we'll, to we'll, hear just, we'll call it market value. <laughs> yeah. So Brain my PI. Yeah. Yeah. What do you guys think? Like my PI, current PI, he's not semi-retired, but he has plans to retire in the next seven to 10 years, he's told me. But he's built a practice to where there's NPs. You know, you talked about mid-level provider. NPs, other MDs working under his roof so he built like a mini kaiser permanente in the community it's just two sites but it's a big location i think those are like the perfect kind of of doctors or pis to work with because they have the database they have the infrastructure they have the trust of the patients in the community which is by the way one of the things that's keeping us small sites around is hey we can actually get patients in your studies robert like you know, we can actually randomize them um, rather than just having theoretical numbers in the database. We'll get them in. We get blood in the tubes and mm. ECGs uploaded. <laughs> we actually, yeah. in our site, we got very lucky because the, the PIs that we have are young. They've been in the industry, in the, uh, in the healthcare, not so long. But the thing is that they have been burned out because they have worked mm -hmm. several hours. They, they basically kind of quit because they didn't have a life. And now seeing research as an opportunity, I mean, we were in the right place at the right moment with the right individual. <laughs> so it's a rare situation, mm -hmm. but those are an older uh, doctors that might be interested in research. Oftentimes they don't even know what it is about or they know exist, but they don't know how to get in. So, yeah. And also from my perspective, I mean, it's, it's kind of tough, you know, when I look at a PI, uh, you know, their, their CV and they have limited experience and they're on the younger side, it really has nothing to do with the age. It's all about the experience of actually conducting the trial itself. Right. So I'm, I'm a little bit, um, gun shy to bring on a PI who's newer. And not to mention, they have a ton of debt to pay back um, that they've, you know, acquired over the years. And and just to your point, Dan, you know, that's why they go to the Kaiser versus even entertaining, um, you know, your your, Very good point. you know, your your small site. <laughs> My pitch. <laughs> for Rob, though, based on that, Rob, why would that be relevant? If the site has the patience, wouldn't that be the relevant question? I mean, you're gonna have to train them anyways. It doesn't matter what site it is. You're gonna make sure that they're trained. So why do you see that as different? Um, you know, that's a great question. I'm not sure I can, ac I actually have a, a, a good answer for that. Um, maybe it's just, uh, you know, it, it, the buck stops with the PI. Like, you know, before we went on the air, we were kind of talking about how the PI is ultimately responsible. Certain stakeholders have their own responsibilities in the eyes of everything. And, you know, PIs I've actually encountered, you know, years ago when I was a monitor, you would not believe how many PIs really just don't understand the obligation and what they signed up for. And they were coerced by a site owner who told them, hey, come in once a week, sign papers, and I'll take care of everything else. And they didn't realize that their license and that, you know, is on the line and they're, 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 they're legally bound by the, you know, 1572 in a sense. It's a contract kind of, right? Obligations are clearly outlined on the back. Um, and you know, they, they, they're like, oh, you know, I, I didn't realize that, you know, I, I'm not, I don't want to be a PI. I, I just, this guy came to my office, he dropped off papers once a week. And I, I have, I'm, I'm not, you know, so I've actually had these conversations with physicians before, wow. um, more, more times than not, where site owners, you know, in a sense, sell them a bill of goods for, you know, in, in this case, actually, this actually happened maybe three, four years ago. He was a retired OBGYN. It was in the Georgia area. 
Um, and I felt my heart completely just broke for this physician. He, his, his wife had passed. He was, you know, well into his eighties and he actually had some health issues himself. And he was literally going to the clinic to work on an endometriosis study out of the benevolent agenda of his own heart. He literally wanted to help these patients who are in pain and um, had no, no idea what he signed up for, Darshan. He had no idea what he signed up for. So, you know, yes, you can train these people, but it's do they really understand the ramifications and what would happen if a 483 were issued to him or her? A so, lot of these side owners... Well, go ahead, there, Sean. Side owner, two parts I to me. Feel like okay, go ahead, Brad. Are um, not to take away from the PI being ultimately responsible because we we make sure they they understand that. But as a side side owner, I almost feel more responsible um, because it is our site. We're running it, so yes, um, just to throw that out there you have those old school ethics though rod you know that the, those true. are I mean, not these days. <laughs> well, a lot of there are some sites out there will do exactly what you said they'll find well very just because they need that position to get that study like that gyn position that's in his 80s i mean my concern would be number one if that's what you're doing to your physicians what are you doing to your subjects exactly if you can't get informed consent from your physician, mm -hmm. what are you doing to your subject? But uh, that that would be my first concern. My second question then would be, if your PI doesn't know what paperwork he or she is signing, are they really good to be a PI? Like how exactly informed are you? Which really, that should be a criteria for whether they can be a PI or not. Not, not so much whether um, they're brand new and they have student loans. If you don't understand what you're signing, for me, that's a, that's a huge issue. Um, so that might be a reason why semi-retired may be problem problematic. I have no problem with semi-retired people as long as you're aware of what you're getting yourself into and you're aware of what you're signing. So that would be my my takeaway on uh, on that front. From a legal standpoint, I think it exposes you to too much risk. I think um, again, I've been involved in some recent situations where the the PI um, was. Was, was being targeted, in my opinion, again, it's from the perspective, I, I've worked for the side, for the site, so I see things from the site perspective. But the PI saw that, uh, the, the PI was being targeted and they landed up signing off to things that they possibly shouldn't have, or in, the, in this case, I think they should have and they still got targeted. I, I think it comes down to the training, it comes down to the conversations you're having, communicating with the sponsors, communicating with the CRO, and not waiting too long. This is going back to the question that Rod was, Rod had, which is how can sites do better? Talk, uh, communicate, and I think that should be part of your. I don't even know why people don't have this, which is who do you talk to on a routine basis? Should possibly be part of every single clinical trial agreement. Who is my direct line of communication? And and if you don't have that, maybe that should be part of your CTA. Maybe you need to have a direct number to the chief compliance officer for the sponsor to go. I can't reach your site. Or I can't reach your uh, person in, in charge of clinical trials. I'm, I'm not sure how far you'll get with it. I've never seen it done because it's never been an issue that I've had to negotiate. But maybe it's something that you need to start thinking about as a smaller site because you aren't getting the attention you need to be able to execute on the studies you need. So. Oh, you can pull that from the protocol. You That's generally could, where they'll get it. Yeah, the question is, are they responding, though? The, the, I've generally found that even yeah. if it says so in the book. Go ahead. No, just, yeah, it, I mean, whenever we've had to do that, whenever we had to escalate, whether it's regulatory, finance, legal, you can pull the appropriate contacts from the protocol. That's where the sponsors bury their contact information. Mm -hmm. There you go. Um, I've, I've had some sites tell me that they've got limited impact even through that. So I'm glad you found a way around it. So I'm glad it's working. Start for calling you. everyone. Open it, page one. Who wrote this Twitter. thing? I'm calling them, all five of them, at all. All of them. Um, yeah, there and uh, back to the original thing, though, just like there's good doctors, bad doctors, there's good companies, Viva, bad ones, Theranos. There's good side owner. There's bad side. owner. <laughs> like I've heard stories from both sides. And at the end of the day, if you're a PI or if you're a side owner, you got to be careful who you partner with. Like that's yeah, just. But... Go ahead, then. <laughs> no, yeah, that's just basic business. Like and I think. 
the valley of some of these bigger institutions is they don't get themselves caught up in these kind of issues or they just hide it well because they're so big. So if they do get in those issues, no one really hears about it. But when you're small and you match up with the wrong partner, you're done. Like, that's it. You're putting all your eggs in that one basket. I would like to add something and correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> especially you, Dr. Fox. So at the end of the day, a PI, what the PI, I mean, if, if we were going to uh, to um, pitch a PI uh, to come at, or, or a doctor to become a principal investigator, because with, with this last part of the video, may, we might scare many doctors, right, <laughs> uh, to go in research. At the end of the day, the doctors, what they do in research is basically the same as they are doing in their normal life, which is taking care of patients, right? That's the main or the, mm -hmm. the, the most important part of research is having, uh, getting patients, I mean, keeping patients out of risk and, and uh, their well-being and their rights to be protected, right? That's what the doctors owe for. So I think that the, the main difference of working in research and working in healthcare is the regula re regulations part and the, and the nuances of being part of research that the doctors can learn. I mean, they already doctors. I don't think that's going to be much difficult for them to understand the whole process. With one study that they do, they will, I mean, if they actually involve in the study, right, they will learn uh, all the processes, everything that mm -hmm. is involved. Obviously, that's it is important that these doctors have the training so they know they are not flying blind in a research. But at the end of the day, they are not doing nothing different than what they do in a regular environment. Because let's say, for example, if they work in a hospital, if they don't know the rules and regulation of healthcare, they will make mistakes too. They can get their license removed the same way as they could do in research. So. I think is is uh, the, the the we need to open more this to 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 the to to the population out there because I think many doctors could be scared of research because they think uh, that maybe their their um, their career could be at risk or because they have to be completely one hundred percent committing to one place that might not be uh, giving them financially at the beginning the same as another hospital but it's it's not the case research is i mean i'm, I'm advocating for research right now <laughs> research is beautiful <laughs> and it's it's a great option for doctors out there it's a great opportunity it's a great business opportunity it's even much easier than studying just your own mm -hmm. um um uh, how you say uh, your own um practice because even with uh, starting with research, getting patients for research can actually start fitting your own practice if that's the, the thing that the, the, the main business that you want to do in the future. And, and like uh, you guys were, like Dan was mentioning, then they can introduce more people in the, in the, in the business, like NPs, nurse practitioners, and co-owners. Exactly. It's synergistic. Mm -hmm. the, the biggest issue when I when I do background checks on a PI, on a potential PI, I look at their license. You could see all their warning, uh, whatever they call those things, right? The um, It's a disciplinary action. So one of the biggest ones, the most common ones I see at least, is unsupervised PAs authorizing refills. Like they usually get hits on their license. That's almost exactly the risk they can take in research unsupervised coordinators, you know, not following the protocol. I mean, it's literally a transferable skill. We talk about transferable skills all the time with CRCs going to CRA. It's the same thing, transferable skills. To be a good PI, it's basically the same transferable skills as it is to be a good doctor. Mm -hmm. That's the way I see it. Um, I'm not sure it's a one-to-one. -one. I think it's close, but it's not a one-to-one. -one. The big difference being that it's an unapproved drug or device. So you sure, don't yeah. sure. But like I had, I had a relatively new PI when I started, and I remember the first study we did. You know, I bring him. I still do. We bring him labs all the time to sign. One of the first patients we saw, he's probably more hyper vigilant than I've seen experienced PIs. I don't like the way this lab's trending. Let's do it again. Unscheduled visit. Like he knew, he knew how to be a doctor. It's it was his first study. 
maybe I'm, oh, I, I don't remember the point we're making, so I can't comment. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, we're talking about the PI when the when the doctors yeah. are getting into the research industry. That oftentimes they don't know what they are getting into, but it it sounds a little scary for somebody that don't know. So I wanted to make it a point that it's not it's not much different than what they're actually doing right now. Uh, in research, because at the end of the day, they owe to protect the patients, whether it is in research or it is in the healthcare industry. That's mm. the main reason they are doing so, what they are doing. So from a legal slash regulatory standpoint, and put in the disclaimer again, not legal advice, yes. but... Uh, but we'll on the, the bottom. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, the, the other thing we should probably consider is the fact that... Um, th and this is important because I think it's it's coming up and we shouldn't make this mistake. There is a difference between doing research and, and the practice of medicine. In <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, there is a difference between those two. And the reason it matters is because, number one, you see, this is this going, going back to something Rod raised a few minutes ago when he talked about the fact that... Uh, what what is the one? What are some mistakes that smaller sites make? You might be a doctor with a medical practice, but you might want to make sure you carry clinical research insurance. That's a separate rider. It's not it's it's not just part of practice of medicine. I can't tell you how many sites I've spoken to who are surprised by this information. Man, that's a sec. Darshan, are you reading my inbox? This is a question I have for you right now. Oh, I'm gonna bring it up right now. Well, it's a real client of ours. I'm not gonna mention them. We are in the midst of a discussion with two other PIs who have expressed interest in research, but have yet to enter in contract with us. Their reasons are they want both their professional liability insurance to be covered by us, as they have no idea what their base compensation would likely be. We are of the opinion that each PI should be responsible for their own liability. We have our own coverage as a site, but we also think of PIs as independent contractors, not employees. And so they don't have the right to this, we believe, but we'd like to get your opinion. And my quick opinion before I know else chimes in is I think you're like uh, being um, uh, way too cautious with it. Like if the PI has value, meaning patience or, or time or oversight, pay the extra 5K a year. That's basically what it boils down to. Can I just make a quick comment on that as I pay my yeah. PIs, their me too. Uh, insurance. And I don't know, I've asked, multiple sites have looked at me like I was crazy, but my physician insisted on it just for the, that, because he's doing research. Yeah, mine didn't. I offered, I said, we're going to do it. Like his was extra 2000 a year. So whatever, but sometimes it could be extra eight to 10 K depending on the state yeah. and the city. I'm curious. I, I've always, and this is some, this is my lack of knowledge. I think it depends on the type of um, disease state you're covering. I remember hearing that things like uh, OBGYN can be in the hundreds of thousands, depending on the state you're in. Um, True. I haven't dealt with OBGYN. Psych, internal medicine, uh, GI, those are the ones I have more experience with. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you're if you're working in a clinical trial uh, site and you have, you're, you're handling the amount of money that can come through, I don't think the five grand is going to make that much of a difference. On the other hand, if you're talking about OBGYNs, and assuming this is still accurate, this could all have changed. But I'd heard that the numbers can be literally like 120 to 180K in just insurance costs, which is why a lot of OBGYNs in Pennsylvania ended up shutting down because <laughs> hospitals are like, I'm not paying for this. Hey, Robert, can we pass that cost to the sponsor? <laughs> <laughs> if he's only, if that PI is only working on my study, maybe. But he better, better not be yet. doing it. Yeah. Or better yet, like Rod said, can we just send you the invoice? Yeah, as long as, long as they're as long as they're dedicated. Listen, as long as they're dedicated only to my study. I actually not to sidebar the conversation, but I we literally had a site come to us and say, you know what? Um, here's our budget, and you know, we want you to in lieu of the budget line items, I want you're gonna pay twenty five percent of the of the investigators' salary. You're going to pay 25% of the coordinator's salary. So then I'm like, okay, you know, I'm totally interested in 
this is this could actually work out in our benefit only in the fat in the event that you actually enroll patients but um we we nixed every single line item in their budget and they actually agreed to this to this to this and, budget and, and contract and so now darshan it's like they're my they're employees of us like you owe us x amount of hours per it, this was it was, oh God, it was oh please darshan, tell me you're trying to stop this I am not kidding you. It I, I it was actually a God. hospital too. I I'll we'll, we'll talk oh more about this God. offline. But yeah, they they literally because we we were all I I I, I talked to this person. You, I talked to that person. You spoke to compliance and they had no issue. What's that? You spoke to compliance and they had no issue. Uh, the CRO legal department had they. Oh, no, they, they are, the CRO legal well, department didn't care. They weren't involved. Yeah, but yeah. The, no, they they were involved. No, no, but I mean, it's who's the signatory on the agreement? So it was the the hospital administrator and and obviously wow. our our us us oh, exactly so the Sierra legal department didn't do shit it has no horse in the game right uh, oh my god Doctor Fox losing his mind over there yeah, yeah that, that I, was I, I, exactly I, my point <laughs> Dan, Dan has the same face that I have I, I don't. <laughs> Just you and I will just talk separately. I'm just gonna let's say let's, let's take it up. I'm just saying, uh, yeah, it, it, it was it was mind blowing to me. First of all, I'm, I I don't lead this particular study. My my colleague does. He he I, he. I would love to have a sidebar conversation with him because we were all mind blown about this and we were crunching the numbers. And I'm like, well, if they you know if they actually enroll this details. amount of patients, um, it, it it was it was it was mind blowing. But the, the the things that sites are coming up with. You know, they literally said that they want twenty five percent. Here's the here's the investigator salary, twenty five percent of this. Here's the so now it's like they're employees of ours, but they're yeah, dedicated, right? Well, here, here are. Let's just ignore the fact that there are possible false claims act issues, anti kickback issues. Let's let's not worry about the fact that the FDA could see this as problematic from the perspective of uh, are the results going to be biased because you've now got an employee. Assuming this is an employee, I have no idea. And I'm I'm gonna assume that all the all the factors I just outlined were addressed in that contract in a very specific legally compliant way, but not knowing the specific facts in question. Those kind, there are major uh, stark law possible. Well, not stark really, because there's no real billing. The next question you need to get into are things like: Are there issues with uh, government payers of any kind? That's that becomes another question, but. Um, Overall, I, if I was the FDA, my first question would end up being, how are you making sure that the results aren't biased? Because mm -hmm. you've got someone whose salary you're paying, which means that the moment you... you so I, don't, I, I, think it's, I think it's the way you look at this. It's not that we're paying their salary. It was just their way of coming back and saying, okay, this physician makes X amount of dollars per year. Instead of paying them a cost per patient, from a line item budget tied schedule of events, you know, you, you just uh, use the, uh, you know, you're, we're, we're paying them based on time allocated to our study. So if the physician says, I have to allocate two hours a day to randomize and see these patients through, that's where the costing is coming from. So, I, I mean, I, I see what you're saying, but I think it's, perspective and it's not that we're coercing them and biasing yeah. the results it's not it, it's, it's just a it's it's a really weird thing i agree with it we can go uh, let's let's talk more about it um yeah let's talk later let's talk but about it's an interesting I'm concept i think the point i was trying to make is that it was the first time i had ever seen something like this it was that's, to my, that's, that's full-blown I, that's academic institution like percent FTEs. You're you're talking about you, like NIH grants and things like that. That's, that's so, a yeah. very interesting, different discussion that we'd have to get into. But I don't see. This is exactly the, the 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 physician that's talking right now. See, many yeah. and this is exactly what this hospital is saying. They wanted a percentage of the salary being yeah. paid, and well, we said we were amenable to it, but we're not gonna. We nixed every single line item in the budget, and we're gonna focus on the percentage of the salary as opposed to the budgeted line item. Typical, you, you know. Like I said, you need more details. There, yes. there are ways to do this, but there are some serious problematic ways this can go wrong and i'd love and, to talk more with you darshan on this i really would absolutely more importantly dan i really want to know what x girls xyz was talking about because they had a really great dating site that they were pitching
I think when they heard you're coming on, they came out, man. <laughs> you know, they're like, hey, we got Sugar Daddy over here. <laughs> Phar- pharmacist and an attorney? Wow. Yeah, we, can't, yeah. we hit the gold mine. You right said now. that Dr. Goldman and Dr. Fox, they're only looking at a lawyer. No, you're the only one I know with those two, with that mix. <laughs> uh, let's see here. We got bring your questions. Okay, I agree with Darshan on what he just said about the staffing issues. My opinion is the principle of Six Sigma should be incorporated into the research world. It will help a great deal on process and performance management overall. I don't know. I think CROs beat the, beat us to death with this kind of stuff. Um, what do you think, Six Sigma? Like, well, why would that be a bad thing? I mean, Six Sigma is really in terms of process improvement. It's process improvement. It's more site burden. Because, but that's exactly the question you asked, right? Earlier, what is the difference between a smaller site and a larger site? It's process, yeah. and, and what you see as burden, they see as improvement. No, we see as another vendor login that we can't access. Yeah, but that's my point. Yeah. I, <laughs> well, maybe, maybe if the processes get, I mean, like, like following that, that maybe, maybe for the sites. Is, is convenient from the business perspective. At the beginning, it's a pain, but then when they adjust, maybe that help the site grow faster. I don't know. That's what I thought when I went to electronic record or electronic <laughs> store. Oh, yeah. Or... Rod had a question, actually, oh, right? Okay. You want me to read? You want to ask Darshan your question directly? Okay. Well, my question, Darshan, is everybody's going to electronic like Vivo or Creo or CTMS, whatever it is. So... The 1572 or the consent or any of those wet document regulatory documents. I look at them, the PI looks at them, every, they sign them, the monitor says they're good, they're in our electronic records. What happens when the FDA comes in and looks and says, wait a minute, that's not right. Where's the wet copy? Do we keep that wet copy of a consent of a 1572? Consent I'm keeping. But I do have concerns with these documents when you're putting them in there. If they go away and the FDA walks in and says, that doesn't look right to us, where's the original? Darshan, before you answer this, Dan, weren't you and I talking about a site who was shredding the ICFs and uploading it into their e-source? Yes. Well, even more hit home than this. <laughs> I want Darshan I to address that also because that that was like, I, I couldn't this even believe very, that. This is a very common issue that Rod's bringing up. Not enough people are discussing. What? I had a monitor, not your monitor, Robert, another study. A monitor told us, hey, what my other sites do with electronic systems is once they upload it to the EISF and e-sign it, they shred the originals. So you can go ahead and do the same thing. I told my staff, no, Ignore what she says. Just keep them in the binder. Like, it's not a lot of papers. Well, sir, we but, don't have the guidance from the FDA on that. Yeah, we don't. So just one person says this, one person says that. Who knows what the answer is? It just sounds so, wrong to shred your originals. Especially the consent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's basically. Yeah, or, or not so much. Yeah. What? Like, what? No legal advice. Let me put it again. Hold on. Yeah, yeah please put that up again. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> he's playing. He's playing a lawyer on, on Zoom. On, on some kind of TV show. Um, so, a couple of different things. So, number one, um, I think it. The FDA, as far as I know, has never opined on wet copies versus electronic copies. Um, there is enough case law out there that says um, that a signature that's wet is just as good as a signature that's not. Um, it, it's So if it if the FDA did this, it's unlikely that they could survive court by saying that um, this is not good enough. This is not a true signature. Um, the, the question, however, if I was the sponsor, if I was the site, do I really want to go through all of that headache to prove it? So it's, it's not so much whether it'll survive, it's do you want to go through the headaches of proving that this is going to be valid? And, and in most cases, it's not worth the headache. Just keep the paperwork. Well, the whole so idea. The practical and legal answers, and there's what the, the, those are two different things, practical versus legal. The whole idea of doing this was to get rid of, 
get away from paper <laughs> and buy so you, you could, and you could take it to the FDA, and the FDA may take a position that they disagree, or they might take the position that they agree, or they might take the position that I just didn't see it, so enforcement discretion. You don't know which one. And you can't even ask the, the uh, auditor who comes in because the auditor doesn't represent the FDA. It's just a auditor's opinion. It's one individual's opinion. Um, and like I just mentioned, no one's ever, as far as I know, opined on this officially from the FDA. The, the real question that you really have to see is, is there any reason that the FDA would think that this is not a valid legal signature? And okay. it's I, I want to add to that, Darshan. Sorry to interrupt. For example, if it's for if it's the delegation of authority log that is being signed electronically, and now and now we have uh, this. Uh, I mean, we don't have the, the the actual paper the because everything the original document is electronic. So let's say if it's signed electronically, now. Now, because the purpose of that, besides putting the page, the 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 task that everybody is going to be doing in the in the study, is to prove the signature or the handwriting from the principal investigator and the rest of the staff. But then, in these platforms, is supposed to be compliant. So, in that is with that specific document, what do you have to say about it? Yeah, I have. Uh... Again, not legal advice, not medical advice. Also, make sure one of the big things is what are your one of the big things you need to have is what do your SOPs say? Make sure your SOPs reflect whatever you decide is going yep. to actually. Yep. That's a big Before. thing, Darshan. Thank you. I actually Thank had you. to look at my SOPs so last week and change much. them a whole bunch. I, Monica, I'll send you my SOPs. I had to change like almost everything because it was written before e systems, and I was realized like this stuff's ir relevant so i changed it all like last week i got it everything's changed change, guys yeah Thank Rod, you make sure right the, the fda comes shot in with a golden it. nugget right there yes they come in and they look at a document as long as they can see that the document is real and accurate i don't think they care whether it's paper or ink so i mean that's the point, paper that's or the point making the, the point that's the point I was making, which is in the end, the FDA is, FDA looks at reproducibility. The FDA looks at whether it it, it is the um, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with uh, Carol's opinion that the paper must be destroyed so it can't be altered, or edited. Mm. Eh, I'm not sure I agree yeah, with that. She's ACRP certified. So who are we? That's supposed to I mean, I mean, nothing I, it doesn't mean I'm right. It's just my opinion. No, no I'm just um, saying this is like why everyone's confused. She's got a good yeah. point, though, Carol. Um, I mean, if that was true, then you could never have any kind of paper copies. Right? They, <laughs> they all be edited and all yeah. um, The only paper we can have is Marvel comic from Pfizer. <laughs> as, a coordinate, as a coordinator over the years who used to have to write everything out or fax it in or whatever, it goes against everything that we wanted to, do, you know, that we do. So it's very difficult for us to get away from paper. I think that's what it is. We're used to saying this is the one source of truth. And for us to say that we can have re records of a one source of truth and there can be multiple copies and they all constitute yes. multiple sources of truth, that's what scares sites yes. into doing a lot of things. You know you what? Because I was taught that. like first day, first week I was a coordinator. My monitor told me, you do someone's vital signs, you write it on a sticky note. I don't that's care if good. you forgot the source. If you yeah. write it on a sticky note or a napkin. <laughs> yeah. You, that's that's your source. That's so not, now, not 2022, they're telling us, no, just shred it, man. Yeah. I, I mean, Carol's actually pointing out, she's like, my, her thing came from an FDA audit. And I, I would re repeat exactly what I said earlier, which is that well, that was one auditor's opinion. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't necessarily, even the auditor was not, may say that, oh, you know what? I either made a mistake or I changed my mind or whatever it is. But the auditor is not beholden to their own opinion. Um mm -hmm. These are not, unless the FDA puts out something through regulations, even guidances are not binding on the FDA. And people are surprised to hear that. So it's, it's I wouldn't depend purely on that. It's helpful. It's, it's uh, permissive. It's, uh, it helps explain things, but it's not binding. 
and well, the FDA will tell you that Dr. Dr. Ju's EMR and they those documents are all electronic um and they don't mm -hmm. question that so I don't know it's just so it's hard as a court uh seasoned coordinator to to on that I, th I think again not not giving legal advice but start with your look look at Dan just selling out put every time someone mentions Viva <laughs> well I also put the girls on there too the when they they were coming after you <laughs> I'm fine with them coming after me. Too. We're gonna have Raul on here in a few minutes. Isn't that the thing? Uh, hi other, everyone. Uh, I'm gonna, I want to say hi, and obviously it's an honor to be here with each of you. I know when I rewatch this video, I'm gonna have a neck pain because I've been like this. I <laughs> <laughs> well, Personally, I'm, I'm just notes. confused. I'm taking my note. So, <laughs> Raul, I'm just confused. confused. How you and Monica are in the same house. I know. That's funny. That's funny. I was going to say that I was going to the meeting because I was going to in my living room and then I see Monica with the same background. And it's like, wow. I mean, it's not even the same house. You're in the same chair. That's the only yeah. explanation. Yeah. You bought the same <laughs> piano. <laughs> Parallel universe. No, but excellent. No, I just want to share with you. Guys, really quick, I'm obviously new in this industry, and obviously I'm absorbing everything you guys are saying. I believe uh, feedback is very important. I see Dan, Rover, Darchan, Dr. Fogg, Monica, and Rod explaining all the feedbacks. But also maybe a question for you guys. It's like, um, well, I do a little graphics for my, for my mind, right? But if we have the site feedback, the sponsored site about electronics, uh, improvement, and such. Me personally, I focus a lot on recruitment and the patient's point of view, okay? So what will be the convenience for any candidate regarding these improvements that we will do on our end? You know, like we talk CVS, Walgreens, they have a huge population, right? Or database. But in my mind, I was thinking, and please, uh, maybe you guys can share this with me. For me, like going to big places like this, I'm not sure how comfortable me as a candidate or patient be sitting there waiting for a long time, waiting for my turn and such and such. At least in our clinic, it's very personalized. I mean, we basically reserved a half a day for one patient only, you know? So early in the conversation, I was trying to visualize how we're gonna be able to see the big players versus the all clinics in that part of volume because everything like we mentioned is a process, right? Process from the protocol for the site and such. But what will be the process in this way to, because at the very end of the day, and please forgive me if I'm wrong, at very end, end of the day, we can have a the super site, but without that, we, we need the patients, we need the candidates, we can have the PI, we can have their database, but we need to, uh, get connected with the patient somehow, advertisement, phone calls, etc. So that's something that probably I would like to bring out just in a personal level, uh, the point of view of the feedback of the future candidates, what we can do to get them in, because at the end of the day, we can structure everything in the perfect world, but we need the candidates, we need the patients. So I hope... Uh, this makes sense or any feedback to what I just commented? <laughs> well, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to understand. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you, I'm trying to understand the question. Or was it a comment? No, it's just a comment because oh. I see that we, um, everything, all the feedbacks are very important. Uh, believe me, every time that I see these webinars, I take my notes, I'm trying to incorporate in our clinics, but also I feel that in one point, it would be good to discuss or bring up patients i mean how because we have structured everything right our clinic the sponsor the protocol and such so i was thinking aloud what about the patient feedback okay are they more comfortable do telemedicine like the early things that we were discussing right yeah so that's, Raul, that yeah. that's where i mean i think you know dan and um dan the host Dan and Dr. Fox um, and Brad did a did a show on patient centricity, oh. and and that's exactly what it all boils down to, along with trust factor, 
right? Patients who are research naive, they're whether they're, you know, groomed patients who have done this multiple times, you know, that's part of what why brick and mortar sites are always going to be what they are. It's it's that exact value of having that interaction and that trust factor. I walk into my doctor's office, I just feel a little bit more at ease than if somebody shows up at my door and scrubs with a with an ID badge that says I'm here to collect your your blood and take your vitals and you know something like that. So I think the trust factor and doing what patients samples, feel is appropriate. Please. Samples. <laughs> samples, please. You know, um, it, it's it's all about that patient centricity, right? Um, so true, Robert. Yeah, That's focusing so on on what brings that person comfort. Because like at the end of the day, no matter what stakeholder you are, whether you're at the site, you're at the sponsor, you're at the CRO, um, you're at a home health care clinic, you know, I think we all um, have a common goal, right? And that's to be here for the purpose of the patients, because without those people, we, we don't exist as a, as a community and we don't advance medicine as a whole. So, I mean, I agree with everything you're saying, but... Um, just to add a little bit of color to it, I think, you know, it's, we, we form our processes and we form these, everything that we do for the comfort of the patient, but ultimately it depends on the patient. Some patients, I have colleagues and people that I work with that um, are a blood collection service. And in terms of what they charge the sponsor, it, it's the same reimbursement, whether they go to a lab or they have home health collection. Mm-hmm. turns out 70% of patients still prefer to go to the clinic versus gathering home health, you know, services. And at really at the end of the day, it's all about control, right? Does the patient want to sit home and wait for this four hour window of when this person's going to arrive? You know, it, it's no, you know what, I'm going to do what's convenient for me. I'm going to go stop at the lab on my way home and give my sample, you know, on my, on my time and control my life. So at the end of the day, it's really just all about what works best for the patient. And as a site, I think that's what they should advocate, you know, making it amenable to them and their schedules to provide that comfort and sense of trust that they are in good hands to what Monica said, that the physicians are upholding their oath, protecting safety, protecting integrity, making sure the patient's interests are at the forefront of all decisions. Thank you, Robert. I appreciate your feedback with decentralized is we're trying to make the patient more convenient, more convenient for the patient is really what we're trying to do. Right. Mm-hmm. And- I, I'm going to, I'm going to agree with uh, Rob on almost everything except one thing, just to bring it a full circle, which is the key term is not patient centricity it's decentralized clinical trials. Mm-hmm. So not a real, <laughs> I should put that underneath. DCT is not this is real not legal advice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is not real. Robert, perfect example. Tomorrow we have a patient supposed to come Thursday for a study. She's already in. It should be an easy visit. She called beforehand and said, "Look, I can only stay twenty minutes. So do what you got to do and get me out of there." I don't see her being able to do this at Walgreens. Like, and do the Walgreens care enough? Yep. Oh no. Well, we can't guarantee, ma'am. So it's up to you if you want to stay in the trial or not. Us? This is like our livelihood. No, okay, we're gonna get you in and out. Mm-hmm. Yes, ma'am. Well, in the winter, different. if we have a patient whose car they're not comfortable driving to us, maybe, or their car is broken, or or they can't get here for another hour, we have the flexibility to to accommodate that or to go get them. Yeah, I would like to add to that that that's part of the majority of the sites or the actual sites that have a strategy for uh, retaining retention program. And the retention program is basically personalize the clinical trial or the treatment with the patient. So we can teach that we, we can uh, treat them as patients or as humans rather than numbers that are bringing exactly. or adding up to the site. And, uh, and, and that for sure is not going to happen or I mean, Maybe in in this in the smaller towns where the relationship with the patients is much closer because the whole town knows every everybody, uh, that will be probably the the exception to the rule. 
But and, and all on, on on top of that, if we think about it, the pharmaceutical industry already have a bad reputation outside our research world, right? And and people having in thinking that they are going to, I mean, they go to the to the pharmacy for to to get the drug and all of that, but then on top doing research with the same company that is giving that that is providing the the drug. From the pharmaceutical industry that already have a bad reputation, I don't know if that's gonna be detrimental for the industry or not. Just because it's coming from one of the big uh, companies that are part of the industry. I don't know if I make my point clear. <laughs> but no, yeah. it's very clear. Um, Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. You know, we're scheduled for 20 more minutes. I want everyone to get their pitch at the end, too, for wherever people want to follow you or what you've got going on. But last maybe 10 minutes before we do that, we've had some questions here. I couldn't get to all of them, but there a lot of them are like motivational questions like this one, um, how to get in the industry. So first of all, before we get into that one, like underneath, I put clinical research is booming. I just want to go around to everybody and get your take, honest opinion on where you think the industry is headed? Is it net positive? Are you worried about this recession? Let's just go in order. I am assuming everyone's order is the same as mine. <laughs> <laughs> Robert? Um, I'll, I'll make it quick. I, I think uh, I, I'm concerned about consolidation. I'm concerned about size of companies. Um, I'm, a, I'm concerned about all those products that could go to market that don't go to market due to, um, you know, the big guys purchasing and consolidating and shelving products. It does happen. Um, but I think, uh, you know, net positive, net negative, I'm kind of neutral. Um, I'm not bullish. I'm not bearish on, on where we're headed. Um, I certainly think it's booming tons and tons of startups, tons of exciting technologies, um, you know, on the horizon that are certainly going to make an impact on patients' lives. But um, I'll just leave it at that. Is it my turn? Yes, for sure. Okay. I, I'm, again, I'm hoping that we're going the same order that it shows up on my screen. Yeah, so. I hope so, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, um, Robert. I, I actually agree with Robert, and that's unusual for me. I don't usually agree with anyone. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but... but um, the, I, I think overall, when you say, how is the industry going to do? I think it, it depends on what part of the industry. It, it's not one single group. I think there's going to be, to Robert's point, there's going to be some level of consolidation. There, uh, I think you're already seeing a lot of that. I'm, I'm, I've been involved in multiple uh, mergers and acquisitions already because a lot of the larger companies are going, you smaller company have some interesting technology. You don't have the, have the money. We'll buy you out right now. That's one thing that's happening. There are going to be some, some companies that simply don't have good technology, and those are just going to fail, which means that the people who go along, who work in those companies are going to fail. And when I say technology, I was really referring to products uh, in terms of biopharmaceuticals. Um, I think technology is being beaten down right now. So you saw this massive bump in, um, in, in technology, whether it was the Googles, the Apples, or whoever else you want to go after. Um, I believe Viva's publicly traded, so I know uh, Viva's doing very well as well. Uh, but overall, I think technology uh, will is, is being beaten down, but I think they're going to come back um, because, I mean, the dominant players will come back. The, the smaller players are really going to have to be strategic about what they do. Uh, and, and I think that's true even for the smaller biopharmaceutical companies because they're going to have to start going, maybe I want to sell off licensing rights uh, to my product within, I don't know, of Korea. Because it's not a market I'm going to go after. It's simpler to have them pursue it. Brings me some money to survive this period of time. I think you're also going to have to see people being smarter, um, whether that's using things like technology, whether it's uh, using things like, and when I say technology, I didn't mean the usual uh, DCT version of technology. I mean things like AI to go, here's a product that I actually believe in. Um, today's news was, uh, and, and uh, Dan, you and I have been, in the podcasting world for far too long. And you and I have discussed um, things like Bitcoin a long time ago, but I don't know if you you saw today's news from, uh, I, I'll preface this, a couple of years ago, I remember you and I doing an interview 
where we talk about will Bitcoin be used to pay sites and be used to pay sponsors. Um, and I don't know if you saw today's news. Today's news was that uh, the euros co come out and they're basically the European Union is saying that we refuse to legitimize Bitcoin right now. Yeah. So for those yeah. people who are bullish about it, well, what does that really mean? Um, I'll take it if they pay us on time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll help with that. <laughs> oh, Dan, both Dan's. If you will take Bitcoin, if they will pay you with that, yeah. God bless you right now. Um, I do too. No, no, I'll just help pay you on time. <laughs> if they pay on time, I'm all in. <laughs> I, I feel like there's a business out there and just paying sites on time. I don't know what the process is, but just doing that, I, tr I truly feel a pain for sites. Um, but I don't know how to make that work better. Um, I can tell you a couple of the CROs to go to. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if it changes the moment you have scale is the question, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so overall, I think I'm, I'm relatively bullish on uh, where the industry is going, but I think that's more medium to long term. And I'm using the term industry to be a much wider term than um, than simply the biopharmaceutical companies. Yeah, that's a very good answer. Thank you. And yes, we would happily take Bitcoin or XRP. Is it my turn? Don't yes, me. Dr. Fox. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So I think the question is, yeah, what are we, uh, what's the state of the industry? So from what I see, I, I found a, it's a precision consulting research survey on the clinical research uh, industry uh, from January, 2021. They predicted about a $47 billion valuation in 2021 with a valuation of near $84 billion by 2030. Now that's strictly the numbers. So, you know, they're predicting uh, definitely a growth in the industry. But I think just as what Darshan was saying, we're going to be seeing a little bit of a different augmentation of that research and maybe how that valuation happens across inflation. Specifically, uh, I think that we're actually going to put the clinical back in clinical research. You're going to see far more integration of clinical research into that of healthcare. You're going to see that of like the Yuma researches and a lot of the other groups here being the privatized research groups who take the specializations into the regions and then literally just go to the local providers, local hospitals and offer that specialty to them at their convenience. So I think you're gonna look at a far more specialized privatization of research and not necessarily like a, a siloed expensive hobby. So I in like other words, that. things are going to be pretty well. I think we're on, we're on the verge of once we finally trust ourselves and integrate technology and we allow sites the resources that they need to invest in their technology, I think that you're going to see a pretty good growth in the research field across the nation. Thank you, Dr. Fox. And thank you for the Yuma Clinical Trial shout out. Raul Gonzalez. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, guys. Um, and I agree with Dr. Fox, too, regarding uh, see a big improvement. Um, my humble opinion, I think it will be increasing. Our clinic was born during COVID. So I believe uh, adapting to each uh, live experience or whatever is happening around the world is about adapting. We we're talking about technology. I'm learning through that, as uh, Rod mentioned. Uh, just incorporating electronic might be a new changing. I'm not sure, but I believe that everything going to be connected, connected to the sites, technology, opportunities. Uh, I believe like you guys are putting here, clinical research is booming. Absolutely. I was part of the CRC almost three years ago, and that brought me to this industry. So <laughs> all the tools are there. Well, CRC you Academy, to... shout out. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Yay. Um, so, so what I was going to say is like this kind of information that you guys provide to either people that are in the industry or seeking to do the changing is going to be super positive. Also, mm -hmm. we need to take uh, encounter everything that we discussed that some people are looking for salary. Some people are looking for joy in the professional environment or future. It all depends. Everything is case by case. Otherwise, we'll spend years talking about the same thing. But Honestly, I believe that is a great opportunity. There's the tools out there. It just matter 
who is going to be in, who's going to give and participate in this uh, movement, if you want to call it that way. So I call positivity. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Raul. <laughs> CRC Academy making us proud. I got to ask, are the blue glasses, fresh, fresh blue glasses, are they from reading too many ePros, too many platforms you got to log into? <laughs> got to protect the eyeballs. <laughs> I assume, I assume, yes, Raul. Thank you. CRC Academy. Monica. Well, my perspective is also, I mean, if we think about uh, what happened during the pandemic for the industry was very, 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 very beneficial, positive financially wise, right? So the companies um, have a lot of money stored because of the uh, COVID or the pandemic. Um, Obviously, a lot of changes, just like all of you guys mentioned, uh, which I think is going to happen. Uh, but I see a bright perspective, a bright look. Um, every every single every single. I mean, obviously, the, the the economy worldwide is is critical. Is 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 uh, is um, affecting every single area. However, it, it, the pharmaceutical industry, because it it grew during the pandemic. I don't think it's going to be as affected as the, as the other industries because at least we have um, money that came from this and, uh, and uh, we were the only, basically the only out of this. Uh, and uh, in many ways, in the technology perspective, uh, economy-wise, financially-wise, we now the the world knows more about research. That's why all of a sudden everybody wants to do research. Even Walmart wants to do research. Mm-hmm. So um, it's, it's if if everybody the big the big the big companies want to go in this industry, that tells us something too. It does. And Brad, thank you for that. Brad made a comical post that uh, Burger King's gonna do clinical trials next. <laughs> Because they got they got the patients. Yeah. They got the patients. Whopper stipends. Yeah, whopper. <laughs> whopper money. Um, yeah. Thank you, Monica. Yeah. CRC That's Academy exactly. instructor. Too. Yes. If thank you. If everybody, if all the companies are are sure. looking at research, that tells us that companies look at the where the where the money is. Mm-hmm. Rod Raphael, the legendary. Sorry, I'd take myself off mute. First, I wanted to say that I had to go to their house for solidarity. Hey, we're all in the same. <laughs> so, Welcome. Uh, I've been in this industry a lot longer than I care to admit. But so there's been a lot of change, but I think the biggest change has been technology. And I think we're still seeing what that's going to look like Uh here in the future, <laughs> a very near future, I hope. But there's a lot of noise in the background about how we do studies, and I don't think that's going to change much. What it, what it really boils down to it is just about recruiting patients. I think, <laughs> good one, Deshaun. Oh, there we go. Um, I really think that um, the industry is in a boom right now and I think it's going to continue. I think you're going to see a lot of big acquisitions between some of the big companies and small companies like we saw back when Kendall was swallowed up and Oh, I remember that, Kendall? Man, yeah. you're old school. You're old school like me. I love That's that. not even old school, but yes. Sure, um, for me it is. <laughs> Kendall Kendall's old school. I they were that. a great CRO. They were great. Anyway. Um Bring back so Kendall. Ken Walgreens reverse merge into Kendall. I'm asking Darshan. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, no, no. Go ahead, Ron. They can reverse merge into anything they want. I'm sure, it's not the same Kendall. Though. <laughs> yeah, Walmart. I mean, sure, get a gallon of milk while you're at it. Um, <laughs> can you imagine if it's a colonoscopy study? Never mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> Walmart, yeah, you can go get your. Anyway, um, I don't see it. I mean, there's there's a lot of noise in the background. I still think we're going to stay pretty consistent the way we've been. I'm hoping technology catches up with us. And um, 
but I like I said, I see a lot of consolidation for the future. All right, and then thank Welcome you, Rod. Welcome everybody and then... to the same house. <laughs> house. I want to invest in this house. Whoever has this house. Yeah. Really, has a lot of people over. I, I hear this is the uh, default virtual monitoring uh, backdrop for virtual monitoring visits. It makes the coordinators at ease <laughs> to answer queries faster. Um, I think I see a TikTok video coming. A TikTok. That, don't get me started on that. All right, let's go once more around. Everybody, tell us like where to find you, what you're working on, what you want people to go after and look at, or whatever. Robert. Dr. Goldman first. Well, yeah, I'm so I I'm I'm very excited for my personal endeavor. Um, we just closed uh, screening and enrollment on a very pivotal phase three pain study that's going to be very exciting therapy. Uh, very unique technology, transdermal delivery platform. So it's not a pill, it's not a patch, it's not an injection. Um, it is a trans. Study. Yeah, Pretty yeah, you heard about that one. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. making waves, making waves. Yeah, so um, really excited about that. Um, we're going to continue that that trajectory and and develop the pipeline. So um, more to come on that. And um, find me on LinkedIn. Connect with me. Um, I do a lot of mentoring to junior colleagues who are wishing to get in the industry, people with higher degrees and higher education and alternative pathways and how to get to where you want to go, uh, feel free to reach out and connect with me. I'm always yeah. happy to um, help where I can. So but nice of you. You just open Pandora's box. By the way, I'll put everyone's link yes. in this <laughs> video in the show notes. Uh, Darshan? Um, thank you, Robert. Dar thank you. Um, my name is Darshan Kulkarni. I have my own law firm that does FD regulatory law called the Kulkarni Law Firm. You can go to kulkarnilawfirm.com. Um, I also teach uh, FD regulatory documents at, um, at Drexel University. Um, I used to I used to be a visiting professor at the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy. Um, I you can find well. I, I wrote a bunch of different chapters. Oh, not this house, the real house. <laughs> <laughs> it just, it's next to your piano, I believe. And the next, it's next to my piano. Uh, hold on, let me, let, me, let me use the real house. There we go. So the, the books that I've, I've written chapters for every single one of those, um, on, and they usually have either like clinical trials or drug promotion stuff in there. So, um, so I, that's some of the stuff I do. I have my own podcast um, called Darshan Talks. Um, and Dan's been on there good worst time. Yeah. Both Dan's have been on there actually. Um, so love to uh, have you guys on. Um, I, uh, let's see, what else do I do? Oh, I also have a, a software coming, which is going to be involved in distribution of documents. Uh, I'm starting out with a different space, but, um, I, I hope to bring it into the clinical research space as well. Um, let's see. And... Yeah, I have I have six podcasts, so I can't really talk about every single one of them. Six, but yeah, I, I, wow. I, actually, it might be more, but yeah. So uh, I had to break it down because apparently YouTube couldn't tell what I was doing. So I'm doing one on drug advertising, one on clinical research, one on pharmacy, one on pharmacy careers, and uh, so the, the first three were on com compliance issues in clinical research, compliance issues and promotional uh, compliance issues in pharmacy. Um, pharmacy uh, uh, career options and one on actually trans individuals. So I'm actually doing it on, uh, it's called Not Alone. So that's what's keeping me busy for now. And I do some videos than Dan. Darshan. <laughs> what's that? Do you have more videos than Dan? Oh, I, I, I have videos with Dan going back to 2009. No, he's, he's asking if you have more videos than Dan. <laughs> oh, I probably do, but, but I don't know. Dan and I have been doing this for so long. I think we both stopped counting at some point. <laughs> Darshan, are you Six Sigma? <laughs> I actually did do some Six Sigma stuff before. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I talk about everything from privacy to bioethics to uh, judo. I, and I, his Twitter is active. Very active. Yeah. It's on the same level as Elon as far as activity. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. That's exact. I'll take his money. I'm not sure I need the distrust he has right now. I, I, I will take Tesla, though. Um, but yeah, so thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Thank you there, Sean. 
Dr. Fox? I'm, I'm Daniel Fox, um, and it's nice to meet everyone. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Darshan, I have a second-degree black belt in karate. I didn't know if you knew that. I, uh, in I, Okinawa, I think karate. you mentioned Whoa. that when you came on. I was, I was U.S. Yeah. number two. Uh, U.S. number two, India number three in judo. So Wow. That was my Wait, Dr. F uh, so Daniel Fox, I, uh, you know that thing we're I'm a doing director of a February? site. I'm an owner of a site, and I'm the founder of the Clinical Research Payment Network. That's my baby. It's literally designed to support clinical sites as a site owner who's been through it all. I get very tired of how sites are being treated on a global level. So I really just want to be here to help support them. The Clinical Research Payment Network offers a really nice streamlined financial solution that I'll be working with some uh, people on this podcast with to try to help to develop. We offer a feedback situation, Raul. So if you wanted to do a feedback situation, uh, join CRPN and uh, contribute to the PACT scores, please. Uh, it's really going to help. We're going to be developing that. Wait, I wait, actually, we have to, just someone real just, quick, Dr. Fox, PACT score, just please. Uh, we, I can't believe we went two hours. You didn't talk about it because Robert Darshan, I don't think anyone outside of myself and Rod know what this is. Oh, he's Dan's been on my podcast. He's explaining. Oh, yeah. oh okay, okay, yeah, okay. Thank you. Oh, and I've, I've had many conversations with with okay. uh, Doctor Fox, so I'm I'm okay. well into the pack score. But I think the audience would love to hear it real quick. Yes. Absolutely. So, pack score is just that. I for the past four years, I've been collecting data on pharma CROs to understand their business behaviors, and I've developed a a risk assessment score. PACT stands for Promises, Access, Choice, and Trust, and it's just that. It's about a fifty question survey. If you are a site and you've had an experience with a sponsor or a CRO, join CRPN, take a free packed survey, help to contribute to the database, and we're going to set an industry standard of expectations and accountability. So the packed score wow. is growing. I love it. We have over well yeah. no more subprime lending. <laughs> nope. Nope. We have. And then the thing is, uh, we actually have the packed scores, and then we. So one of the revenue streams that CRPN is doing is we're selling packed reports. So if there's something that you want to know about a sponsor or CRO, uh, submit a packed report request and we can send you everything that you would need to know to make a good business decision. So, so again, and I can really tell you from a, from a sponsor <laughs> perspective, I'm a big fan of what Dr. Fox is doing and uh, plan to support his mission fully. Mm -hmm. And Yuma Clinical Trial signing up today. It's free. Yep the free Welcome. version and yeah we're joining glad to be yep. helping we hit 10 sites and i'm really hoping we can hit 20 sites by the end of the year if you know any clinical sites who are interested in joining crpn and contributing to the pack score and accessing any kind of a gap in their services that they might need and helping to voice the the next step that i have is actually good clinical business practice training it's like a, a gcp training specifically for sponsors and cro's to understand how they should be treating you as a business, but it's also a training for sites to understand how they should be treated. So I any of those this. sites who don't know. It's payback to the sponsor. You give us all these trainings, <laughs> we're going to give you a training to do, or else we're not doing studies yep. anymore. I no, love it, this Dr. Fox, can you please <laughs> share the links, how people can get to do that? Raw, Monica, Rod are going to yes. join. Yes. So just uh, go to uh, www.crpaynet.com. That's just crpaynet.com. Uh, you can join up, contact me. We can get you hooked up to the network and we can get you on, along your way. So uh, Dr. with Dr. that, Dr. I absolutely to, to join the network. Uh, for sites, it's free. Oh, there you sites go. Join. Sites join for free. And if sites request services, then of course we'll have a service contract in place and we can go on a consulting agreement. But I don't want sites to feel like they, they're denied of the access or the ability to contribute to the industry. So I want to make sure those barriers are very low. And let me just add a, a shameless plug for Dr. Fox for my sponsor friends watching. Um, there's a huge benefit to sponsors using the network, um, financial benefit. So reach out to me and I can provide that insight to you on how it may benefit your next program. Mm -hmm. I love his ideas so much. Like I thought it was funny at first, but funny in a good way. Like that TikTok trend, not funny. <laughs> ha ha, but funny. In a good way. <laughs> you can give sponsor training like, no, screw you. 
your pec score is crap. Like, if you want me to work with you with my real patients, they're not standing in line at some Walgreens, you're going to do this training because we need you up to par to work with us. Just to be clear, we also love Walgreens. We love, eh, I don't know. <laughs> I love some people that work at Walgreens. I'll leave it there at that. But no, other than that, I've got a lot going on, just like Darshan. I don't have as many podcasts, but I think I have more companies. And uh, it keeps me busy, and I'm very thankful for it. At our thing that we can talk about in February 2024, but I'll tell all of you offline, you guys both black belts. We should do something like content for charity. <laughs> I already yeah, had something. <laughs> yeah, pay view. We'll do no, something. No, no, I, I, I feel challenged right now. Because Dr. Fox said he uh, he has more companies than me. Are we not counting my two gas stations? <laughs> yeah. I don't know about those. Oh, no, or, you like, you my win. real estate. Like, wait a second. Calm down here. <laughs> hey, you're going to do drive through <laughs> research. Yeah. You can collect data in the gas station. Yeah, while you the, pump gas, the... you get your consent at the TV screen. Yeah. I'm pump Indian. I'm required by law to have gas stations. <laughs> <laughs> You don't have a motel or hotel? I don't have a motel or hotel. I really should invest in at least. Yeah, there's something called the, uh, the Patel Motel, I believe. Yeah, you need there's to have patient capability. You can have inpatient capability and drive through research yeah. capability. And donuts. And donuts. <laughs> or get the comorbidities going, of course. Get, get, get the Duncan going. Get the A1C oh, up so they can Darshan, qualify. Darshan, did you speak any Japanese while you're doing judo? A uh, little bit. No, I mean, I wouldn't say I'm fluent, but yeah. We decided we're going to start a donut shop called Moichi Dough. <laughs> it just kind of sells itself. <laughs> no I, joke, I, guys. I, had I, a I, I, I didn't speak enough Japanese to understand it. I feel like I should, but I'm not smart enough, so help me. Sorry. Moichi Dough is Japanese for one more time or just one more. Ooh, wow, I like dope. that. If you made a donut shop called Moichi Dough, Pretty much just selling too. a lot of donuts. So wait, what is Mo Moichi Dough Donuts? Moichi Dough. Moichi no. Donuts. Yeah. Oh, so I, I would do Moichi Donuts, not Moichi Dough Donuts. No, just Moichi Donuts. Yeah. Oh, got it. Okay, I can work with that. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> there you go. I, I think I can start a clinical research site with Real story. Moichi Sorry, Sites. Guys. Right Real in the back. Story. <laughs> side Owner Academy, we had it. This guy was a client for like four months. He's probably still successful. Successful, he owned many uh, shops that, that would sell donuts um, around SoCal. He knew a bunch of doctors. He had all the patient. It's not that far off from Walgreens, honestly. Like, this is more DCT than mm -hmm. what they can do. He has all, all these shops all over, patients coming in. He created a research clinic. He's doing well. Can you wow. imagine if he actually started up, landed up recruiting all your diabetes patients and heart failure patients? <laughs> Seriously, too. A1C's, yeah. I yeah. can tell you if, if you, it's it's like going to a, a gym and and being in the pain world. I think sponsors should recruit at gyms is really what I'm saying right now. That's next. Don't give them ideas. But thank you <laughs> so much. Right in the gym. I feel like in February thank 2024, you. we have a we have something special if you, we could get you both there. Raul Gonzalez. Uh, I'm taking notes of the donuts so for expansion. So. <laughs> That's a check mark. Well, perfect. So once again, thank you for being here. My name is Raul Gonzalez. I'm the site owner for Clarity Clinical Research in Los Angeles. Um, I'm honored that our life, our path crossed with Dan, Monica, and Chris almost like five or six years ago. And that's why I made the jumpstart to a new career to this industry through the CRC. Uh, my background is uh, medical equipment, radiology, and I'm still doing that. Uh, we sell a lot of uh, equipment that we specialize in mammography. And obviously, um, um, the opportunity to serve is very important for me through this clinical trial world. Uh, open my eyes of awareness, in this case, mental health. So have helped me to understand, try to give, and also to learn. So that's why I'm here. So thank you, guys. Thank you. Love you, man. Um, and it's been eight years, but who's counting? Wow. Yeah. Eight. Never mind. It's eight. That's why I have gray hair now. <laughs> <There you go. laughs>
Okay. Monica Quitiva, I guess it's the one and turn. only. <laughs> well, I'm part of many projects, many things. One of those, I'm, I'm co-owner of Clarity Clinical Research with Raul. <laughs> um, we also have a, a, a podcast in Spanish that we've been doing for research. It's, not, it's called La Voz de los Ensayos Clinicos. We, we talk about research and educate people about it and professionals about it. Um, I recently also released a little book um, that talks about the process of uh, the screening, the screening process, step by step, uh, because I know that was kind of a, um, a thing for the sites or for the coordinators sometimes that missing parts of pieces and especially for the screen process that is so important. So I wrote it initially for our students and for the coordinators that we were training, but then uh, I say, why not? <laughs> Let's publish it for everybody else to use it. Um, I'm also part of the Clinical Research Circle, which I'm partnered with Dan, uh, Chris, and the whole group. And uh, with the Clinical Research Circle, we have the University of Clinical Research, and uh, that's how we train people in many, many, many different areas, uh, from students that just finish high school to professionals that are in the industry that would like to cross uh, to a different, in different path. Um, we have classes like CTA, CRC, CRA um, for clinicians. We have the class for um, data management and medical writing. And, um, and then we also have the Latinos in clinical research. Shout out to Jennifer that was mentioning me earlier. <laughs> um, Jennifer Gonzalez, yes. <laughs> um, and uh, in, and um, obviously with Latinos in clinical research, we do a lot of education too, that's our core and, and uh, advocating for minorities in clinical research. Uh, so that's basically all. And I'm participating in any webinar, any uh, interview that we can to, to educate ourselves and educate everybody else. I think the best way to learn is by teaching. And, uh, and this is what we're doing here, discussing with people that have so much uh, knowledge about the industry, so much knowledge in many other different things and, and diversity, as we can see in this group, is a very diverse group and, and we have so many different points of views and we learn so much and we transmit this education to everybody. So thank you for having me here, Dan, as usual. Oh, thank you, Monica. Um, finally, last but not least, the legendary Rod Raphael. I don't know about legendary, but... Thanks, Dan. Um, I'm going to keep it true to what I usually talk about here. So I love to re I love to um, network with sites, share leads, um, and best practices. Um, I'm an independent research site owner in Indianapolis. My name is Rob Raphael. I do this with my wife, Anne Marie, um, in Indianapolis. And um, we've been doing it for about 16 years. Um, if you're interested in one of our studies, call this number, 317-297-7999. We have a clinical study for you. Anyway. Rod, come in prepared. <laughs> Regardless, Rod, um, you, can, you can find me on LinkedIn and Instagram and most of the social media sites and at www.investigatorsresearch.com. Thank you. I actually Love forgot it, to mention that. I'm in LinkedIn. So if anybody has any questions or want to reach out, I'm, I'm in LinkedIn. Oh, everyone's LinkedIn oh, yeah. underneath. Connect with everybody right now. If you're listening on the podcast later, thank you. Show notes, everyone's link. Let's go connect, collaborate. Thank you guys for going over two hours. It's amazing. And thank you all the viewers and commenters and everyone else. I appreciate and we can do this more often. Sounds good. Thanks a lot, everybody. Sounds good. All right. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone.